Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa, where we take difficult biological concepts and make them easy to understand. Today, we're going to be venturing into the second part of our three-part series on metabolism. In this video, we're going to be learning about lipid metabolism. In our last video, we learned about carbohydrate metabolism. Carbohydrates might be your body's go-to fuel, but when it comes to long-lasting energy, fats take the lead. Gram for gram, lipids pack more than twice the energy of carbohydrates. But before your body can tap into this powerful source, fats must first be broken down. When you eat foods like butter, oils, or nuts, your digestive system gets to work, breaking down those fats into fatty acids and glycerol. This process kicks off in the small intestine where bile salts emulsify fats, making them easier for enzymes called lipases to digest them. Once absorbed, these fatty acids take one of two paths. Either they're stored for later or they're immediately converted into energy. But how exactly does your body turn fat into fuel? That's what we're going to uncover in this video. Unlike glucose, which dissolves easily in the blood, fats are hydrophobic or water-fearing and need help traveling through the watery environment of your bloodstream. That's where lipoproteins come in. These are specialized molecules that package and transport lipids to make sure that they reach the right tissues. There are four main types of lipoproteins, each with a unique role. Chylomicrons are the largest lipoproteins. They form in the mucosal epithelium of the small intestine and are responsible for transporting dietary or ingested fats from the intestines to the tissues. Very low density lipoproteins or VLDLs are made by the liver. These carry mainly endogenous or made in the body lipids. VLDLs carry triglycerides to the cells for energy or storage. Low-density lipoproteins, or LDLs, carry about 75% of the cholesterol in the blood and deliver it to the cells for use in repair of cell membranes and synthesis of steroid hormones and bile salts. They are often referred to as bad cholesterol, since LDLs can contribute to plaque buildup in the arteries if the levels of LDLs are too high. High-density lipoproteins, or HDLs, collect excess cholesterol and transport it back to the liver for removal. Since HDLs prevent the accumulation of cholesterol, they are known as good cholesterol. HDLs help maintain heart health, and a high level of HDL is associated with a decreased risk of coronary artery disease. Once brought into the body through digestion, fats take one of two major paths. Either they are stored for later use, or they are oxidized for immediate energy. If you consume more fat than your body needs, it is then stored in adipose tissue as triglycerides, which is a long-term energy reserve. When energy is needed, these triglycerides can be broken down into their monomers, which are fatty acids and glycerol, through a process called lipolysis. This is catalyzed by enzymes called lipases. Glycerol is converted to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, one of the three compounds also formed during the catabolism of glucose. If ATP is abundant in the cell, then glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is converted into glucose, an example of gluconeogenesis. If ATP supply is low in the cell, then glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate enters the catabolic pathway to create pyruvic acid. Fatty acids are catabolized differently and yield more ATP. Unlike glucose, which is broken down in the cytoplasm, fatty acids must first enter the mitochondria to be metabolized. This process, called beta-oxidation, systemically breaks down fatty acids two carbons at a time, producing acetyl-coenzyme A. Once acetyl-coenzyme A is formed, 
it can then enter the Krebs cycle where it undergoes further oxidation, producing more NADH and FADH2. If you remember, these are our electron carriers that can then power the electron transport chain, driving ATP production. Since fatty acids contain long hydrocarbon chains, they yield significantly more acetylcoenzyme A than glucose, resulting in far more ATP per molecule of fat than carbohydrate. This is why fat is such an efficient energy source, especially during prolonged fasting or endurance exercise. But what happens when glucose is scarce, like during fasting, low-carb diets, or even prolonged exercise? That's where ketogenesis comes in. When carbohydrate intake is low, the liver converts excess acetylcoenzyme A from fatty acid breakdown into ketone bodies, which serve as an alternative fuel source for the brain, muscles, and heart. However, if ketone production becomes excessive, as in uncontrolled diabetes, it can lead to ketoacidosis, a dangerous drop in blood pH. On the flip side, when energy intake exceeds demand, your body converts excess glucose or amino acids into fatty acids through lipogenesis. This process occurs primarily in the liver where acetylcoenzyme A from glucose metabolism is used to synthesize new fatty acids, which are then stored as triglycerides in adipose tissue. This process ensures that energy is available for times when food is scarce. Lipid metabolism allows your body to switch between using carbohydrates and fats for energy. It's what helps you sustain long periods without food, power through endurance activities, and store energy efficiently. Understanding how your body processes fats can help you make informed choices about diet, exercise, and overall metabolic health. If you found this breakdown helpful and want to learn more about metabolism, be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Next, we'll explore protein metabolism, another key piece of the energy puzzle. See you in the next video.